All right, welcome everybody. My name is Steve Pardue, one of the managing members at Elevate Oral Care. Our speaker today is Dr. Jeremy Horst. Our team of preventive care consultants had the honor of listening to him and interacting with him at our last Elevate Oral Care National Education Meeting. Dr. Horst is a practicing pediatric dentist and a biochemist known for investigating the strengths and limitations of silver fluoride therapy and helping to develop smart fillings. His mission is to reduce suffering from tooth decay by driving the development of better treatments and preventives. In his teachings and clinical practice, he focuses on maximally effective, maximally effective, minimally invasive techniques to stop dental caries and create an easy relationship for dentistry for children and people with special health care needs and uncontrolled caries. His accomplishments are much more and beyond what I've mentioned here, but in the interest of time, I will turn it over to Dr. Horst. Thank you so much, Mr. Pardue. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity. And to the um, over 700 people that are live logged in already, thank you so much for the honor of your time. Uh, these are This is a complicated time in the world, obviously, and um, we are all trying to do what we can to help. And I thank you for trusting me with your hour. Um, I hope that we all come out um, a little bit ahead from where we were uh before i hope that this can be of some use to you in providing care for your community uh, as we go forward over the next year um, and i hope to be a resource to all of you um, as we go forward whether it's through the dental the dental public health listserv or ipedo or email <clears throat> i will put my email on at the at the end uh happy to continue conversations um, so I just have to give a big nod to uh, Dr. Matt Allen um, and my kids. So uh, Dr. Allen gave a wonderful course yesterday on patient-centered communication. Um, and when I was uh, listening to his webinar, uh, I was with my three kids that happened to be about the same age as his three kids. Um, and so they were uh, having a nice calm moment in a little shade structure that we built earlier in the morning um while dr allen was speaking here this is just yesterday um and so i can appreciate that all of you may be with your families um i can appreciate that you may be on a walk outside listening to this um dr allen is extraordinary at uh giving courses without a lot of slide information this course does have a lot of slide information um, so I'm happy to share the slides with anyone at any time for any reason. You can use them as you please. Um, and I, I thank you again. <clears throat> I would also like to share um, that, that some of the concepts um, and details of this course um, are in a book uh, that was assembled by Steve Duffin, Jackie Jewell, um, another gentleman, and Marcus Duffin. Uh, that was published um, at the very end of the year last year. And so um, this really assembles a lot of the last 10 years of progress, <clears throat> pardon me, of progress um, in, in assembling minimally invasive dentistry uh, into a cohesive uh, approach to manage uh, caries. So that's, that's out there in the world. Shameless plug. There'll be a, two more book plugs uh, as we go along. So here's the outline uh, for the rest of our time together. I have been diving headlong into trying to figure out the balance of practicing dentistry uh, amongst a uh, serious coronavirus um, outbreak that's going on right now. And I hope that um, a few specific points here can be can be useful to you and can frame um, the material that we'll go through in the context of providing uh, dental urgent care, uh, even during the lockdowns and shutdowns, um, and then how to provide care thereafter. Um, and so then we will go through a conceptual overview. Uh, and so this, this course really, this is a brand new course. I, I started putting it together yesterday and finished it last night. Um, it, it really assembles a lot of concepts that have been developing uh, for, like I said, for about a decade. And so hopefully this will really help everyone to understand where the different techniques fit in what, and why we do them and therefore how we can optimize them to take care of our patients. And at the end, um, there's an incredibly simple algorithm 
for using these techniques um, to, to manage caries really in any patient. Um, and so we're gonna start diving in. If you haven't seen it before, this is the American Dental Association uh, definitions on dental emergencies and dental urgent care. Uh, it, it was just updated a week ago, as you see. Um, and there's, there's a number of very useful um, components here. And some states and regions um, are only allowed to do dental emergencies, and some can also do urgent dental care. And um, some practitioners are choosing to do one or the other. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the relevant points here um, is extensive, extensive dental caries or defective restorations causing pain. And um, that the American Dental Association is, um, is instructing us to manage with um, interim restorative techniques when possible, such as silver fluoride and glass anomer, silver diamine fluoride and glass anomer, um, I think is a demonstration that these, that these approaches are no longer on the fringe or considered totally new, but really uh, accepted and integrated by organized dentistry. Um, and, and a lot of us use these uh, techniques as a, as a part of permanent, not only interim care, but certainly it's very straightforward to use them for interim care, as we will talk about. Um, another piece is tooth fracture resulting in pain. Um, silver diamine fluoride is incredibly useful in decreasing sensitivity. Um, so if there is a non-complicated exposure, I'm sorry, uh, fracture, uh, where the pulp is not exposed, uh, but the tooth is sensitive, um, this is, uh, silver diamine fluoride is a useful tool in managing these symptoms and sensitivity um, of a fracture. And uh, if there's no carious dentin or, or demineralized enamel, it will not stain. Uh, so that's an option there. And then, um, like I say, going forward, after the shutdowns close, um, these techniques can help keep you uh, safe and minimize transmission of really any virus, any um, airborne or droplet virus during routine uh, dental visits and restorative uh, care. And um, as Dr. Jeanette McLean will explain later today, um, you can actually have incredibly aesthetic outcomes um, if you manage particular considerations of these. Of these. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been diving through the literature and the single most useful paper I've found um, was actually produced here um, in the uh, Dental Health Center at the, <clears throat> at the, in the U.S. Public Health System in San Francisco in 1969. Um, and <laughs> thanks to Martin McIntyre and Robert Wyant for pointing this out to me. Um, they created this setup to really measure uh, what microbial aerosols are produced during different dental procedures. And <clears throat> um, there it is. Okay, sorry. So just focusing in the upper left, my, uh, my data got pulled out a little bit there. So just focusing on this group with the activities. Um, <clears throat> a lot of folks have asked me, you know, can we do can we have people brush their teeth or can we use a profi brush um, instead of a polish? Uh, instead of a profi, can we do a toothbrush profi? Um, and this study measured the CFUs per minute, the amount of bacteria spread into the air, not by droplets, but by aerosol, uh, by different procedures and different activities, such as just breathing, uh, gargling, eating, whistling, shouting, coughing, and sneezing. And what you can see there is that brushing the, the patient brushing their own teeth in this air chamber um, actually produces five times more bacteria in the air than sneezing. Um, so it actually produces quite a bit of bacterial aerosol. Um, and so that is something that we should be concerned about in the dental um, setting. Uh, and then in terms of procedures that are that are placed, sorry, that are done to patients on the upper right side. Um, examination and scaling, careful scaling, uh, really does not produce very much aerosol, uh, bacterial aerosol, no more than just a patient breathing. Uh, a profi does, as you see, and drying the teeth with air spray as well does uh, produce about twice as much bacteria in the air as the patient sneezing. 
Um, and of course, all the rest of the procedures produce a ton of aerosols. Um, if you look at the bottom in the middle, uh, you can see that they did a little study on how, um, how long after the patient had um, produced an aerosol uh, in this chamber did the bacteria stay around. Uh, and so 24 hours later, there was still some, albeit quite a lot less. Uh, and they, they measured the, the particle size in the air. And it turns out that um, particle sizes of under five microns and in particular under one micron seem to stay steady in the air, supported in the air for a long time. And so that's one of our concerns is about the aerosols. Aerosols keep microbes in the air uh, for a very long time. <clears throat> and when we are sticking our heads into those aerosols and future patients are coming into those aerosols, that could be a concern. Um, and so what you see on the right side of each of these tables at top is the um, percent of particles in the air that are less than one micron and therefore will hang around a very long time. Um, and so it's impressive to me to see that just doing an examination or even a scaling, a careful scaling, um, does not produce, uh, does not seem to produce aerosols that keep the microbes in the air for a long time. Uh, so that's encouraging that we can at least take a look at our patients if we need to in the coming, I don't know, what is it, months? Nobody really knows, of course. Um, but this to give it this, I wanted to share this with you to give a perspective on um, what procedures, including just brushing your teeth, can produce microbial aerosols that can endanger us, um, the people we work with, and other people we work for, uh, patients, that is. <clears throat> There are, there's been an impressive amount of work done, uh, including that paper and many others, uh, looking at interventions. What can we do to minimize microbial um, aerosols during our dental procedures? Um, and nothing seems to be perfect, uh, but having a pre-treatment rinse um, with a proper inverted rubber dam, uh, this is not what we do in pediatric dentistry, and so I had to make sure to put a picture on there you know, we cut a slit and go from a primary molar to a canine uh, and everything's coming in and out from the floor of the mouth or the palate, um, but a proper rubber band with a hole for each tooth uh, in, you know, dried and inverted um, the antiseptic, sorry, yeah, antiseptic rinse um, before the rubber dam is placed on is really there to help control uh, microbes while you're putting the rubber dam on. And then you can apply an, an, an antiseptic on the teeth after they're isolated. Um, and then there's lots of options to choose from there. And or just a really focused high volume suction where everybody's paying attention to where the, where the spray is going also dramatically reduces aerosols. Um, and so there's a recent study that really looked at, that looked at uh, with this SARS um, coronavirus 2, uh, the current one that's causing COVID-19, um, that it does seem like high concentration ethanol, uh, hydrogen peroxide, at least 0.5% uh, or 0.1% solution of sodium hypochlorite uh, placed for one minute on surfaces. This is not a dental study, um, but these work a lot better than chlorhexidine to kill this particular virus. Um, and so if you have a rubber dam on uh, or a patient can tolerate uh, one of these solutions uh, on a focused area, um, this can really dramatically reduce the number of um, uh, infective microbes um, in the area, so something to consider. <clears throat> Last thing um, is that aerosols, uh, we're really not very familiar with these in most of dentistry, and so um, I encourage everyone to, to think about how uh, aerosols uh, can go around our face shields and our loops, um, and it is, it is a known uh, principle that viral aerosols can infect through the sclera of our eyes. Um, so we really need to protect our eyes uh, with goggles uh, one way or another. I, I am not above using swimming goggles. Uh, if you still have your chemistry goggles, uh, the woman at the top, um, 3D and laser, you know, cut her uh, 3D printed and laser cut those goggles. Uh, there's all sorts of kits out there. If you have something around, uh, use it. It's important. Um, and so, you know, if you're doing dentistry in anything that looked like the dentistry you're doing a month ago or four months ago, uh, you should probably look like this for a while and just note that they have those um, N95 masks, 
Uh, we need simple testing to make sure that we're using those properly. Goggles, face shield, all this stuff. It's going to be crazy. I wish everyone luck. I'm not an expert on this stuff. Just trying to have some useful information for everybody out there. Um, and now I will get off my soapbox about my public dental service announcement. Thank you for bearing with me on that. I seriously appreciate it. Hopefully it's helpful. Okay, so now we're gonna go through the conceptual overview of how to apply minimally invasive techniques to dental caries. And what you see here is that I've, I've separated the concepts uh, into progressive ideas about how our understanding of dental caries um, fits with our ability to control dental caries. And so the first step is staging. And, and the big idea there is that, is there a cavitation or not? Is it an actual cavity, an actual hole in the tooth or not? And we'll go through that. Cleansability. Can the entire lesion in particular, including the lesion of, uh, sorry, in particular, the inside of the tooth uh, of the cavity, can that be cleansed uh, by the flow of saliva, by a toothbrush? Um, and that turns out to have a huge impact on our ability to stop um, cavities from progressing, dental caries lesions from progressing uh, without a restorative material. Uh, sealing in carious dentin, uh, I think still to the majority of dental personnel is the craziest idea they've ever heard of. We'll go through some of the evidence and what we've learned from the clinical outcomes. Um, and I would, I would emphasize just as a primer for that point, that we have learned more from clinical outcomes than we have been able to use principles to inform how to approach these things. And so that really has been staggering and I think is the most surprising part of all of this. So we'll get into that. And then a foundation for what Dr. John Fricella calls integral strength. Um, we'll get into that. And then a, I believe an exceedingly simple algorithm of how to put these uh, concepts together. <clears throat> Cavitation. This is a, a cleaned up version of a, of a beautiful table put together uh, by the ADA, American Dental Association Council of Scientific Affairs. Uh, the first author was our, my good friend and mentor, Doug Young, um, and lots of other amazing people like Brian Novi and, and many others. Uh, I think Tim Wright and Margarita Fontana probably did some magic there too. Anyway, lots of people contributed to this and it stands on the shoulders of giants. And the basic concept here uh, is that depending on what a cavity, on, on what a caries lesion looks like visually and what it looks like radiographically, you can really determine whether a lesion is cavitated, whether there's an actual hole that would let bacteria into the dentin. Um, and so if you look, there's these columns that's sound, initial, moderate, advanced. That's what the ADA slapped on this. Uh, these concepts have been around for a while and the ICDOS system for decades, I believe. Uh, zero, which is a totally sound tooth, there's nothing wrong. One and two, which is demineralization, there's no actual hole that would let bacteria in. Uh, three or four, where it's it's unclear whether there's a hole, it could be a, a, a very small hole that's difficult to detect, um, but probably not. Um, and then an obvious hole. <laughs> and so of course the the orange area, the moderate, is is the area of concern uh, but what's astounding is that a radiographic lesion that is into the dentin um, is almost certainly not, that's in the outer third of the dentin, is almost certainly not cavitated. So if you see a radiolucency at the DEJ or in the first third of the dentin, this is not the focus of this talk. This is a well-established principle um, that 99% of those, uh, there's no actual hole in the tooth letting the letting bacteria into the dentin where they could really cause problems. What's getting in there is the chemical output, the metabolic output uh, of the plaque when it makes sugar um, into the tooth. And so the, 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 there's chemicals being released by the bacteria that get into the dentin, but the bacteria themselves are not getting in, and therefore it's a totally different game. Now eventually the, the dentin will be so demineralized that the enamel will be undermined and start to break and crack, and the enamel has dissolved away and you get a hole. Um, and so what you can see is that uh, once there's a hole, uh, you know, there, there's an indication for a procedure. But what the American Dental Association has actually come out and said is that when there's demineralization uh, and there's no hole into the dentin, uh, there's no indication for our procedures. And so at that point, really what's most important to do is counseling and topicals. 
Now we got a whole hour from Dr. Matt Allen yesterday on counseling. We'll do a future course on topicals and I'll present the concepts for that in a couple slides. And the area in between is really the question and that's where the clinical judgment comes in. Uh, do you do procedures on these, on these lesions uh, or do you do topicals and counseling? Um, and so just to uh, emphasize the point that there's a ton of literature studies going back far before GV Black on uh, looking at cavities from the outside, carry lesions from the outside, uh, taking the tooth out for whatever reason, chopping it up and looking on the inside and seeing what's in there. Um, and it can be very surprising that a tooth, a lesion like this too here, um, really there, there's no microbes getting from the outside of the tooth to the inside of the tooth. And if you see that chalky white area in the ICDOS2, um, that is all preventing bacteria from going into the tooth, just like Dr. Doug Young's analogy is that if you're standing on the beach, the water can seep through the sand, but you are not going to fall through the sand. So the bacteria can stand on that enamel and their acid can go through, but the bacteria cannot get through that, that porous enamel. Um, okay, so <clears throat> the idea there is that any non-cavitated lesion can to some degree remineralize, strengthen, and be a long-term solution. There's no hole. And so this gets us into the concept of really what are the dynamics of dental caries? Uh, we will dive much more deeply into this uh, during the prevention course, which will come up in a couple weeks, maybe two weeks. Uh, but of course, there's the teeth, that's the substrate, there's the bacteria. Obviously, they um, there can be good bacteria and bad bacteria, and the goal there is to control the bacteria and guide them to be more healthy. There's lots of tools to change the bacteria. Most of them just kill the bacteria. Silver does that. Iodine does that. Xylitol, if you catch it at the right time, it seems to change the bacteria. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but sugar eaten by the bacteria, of course, produces acid that dissolves the tooth. So these are the three main dynamics, and the fourth is the tooth, and there's others coming um, that we can understand to control the caries process. And so really the other big dynamic is saliva. Saliva buffers the acid, saliva can make the sugar flow away, um, and it can help control the bacteria, of course. Um, and the big hidden piece here is, is other nutrients. And so there's um, increasing evidence that nutrients um, that are in traditional diets, uh, like the ones that you see there in the picture, uh, make ex large positive impacts on, on um, the, the caries process. And so the idea here is that you can use this understanding that dental caries is caused by bacteria eating sugar, making acid that's balanced by saliva, and that the nutrients in our food uh, can displace the sugar, can get the bacteria to do uh, healthy things like arginine does, uh, like vitamin B complex and vitamin A does, um, like oils help to remove the sugars displace them and drive the bacteria to take other parts of their metabolism. Uh, anything that can buffer can help re relieve the acid. And anything that promotes our saliva can also help. There's some old evidence that, that uh, an effective um, exercise regimen uh, can help produce healthy saliva. There's strong evidence that vitamin D uh, makes better saliva, et cetera. So <clears throat> if we're trying to fight caries, looking to this map helps us to uh, to do so. And what we've found over the last few years is that the things that we normally think of as prevention, if you do enough of it, it can stop lesions and therefore be treatment. And so the classic example here is if you take a, a, a one-year-old who's been nursing nonstop uh, and they stop nursing uh, at lib, you know, they nurse five times a day instead or, say, or eat or, or nurse five, six times a day, um, a lot of their lesions in the anterior, if they're early enough, will just stop. If they start brushing better, it'll stop. Um, and so we've seen this for years. Uh, you know, brushing with fluoride toothpaste can stop lesions in the anterior of um, primary teeth as demonstrated by Dr. Edward Lowe about 20 years ago in a clinical trial. So the more that we rely on all of these tools, 
uh, the more we can actually make a long-term impact on carries management. Using the tools that Dr. Allen shared with us yesterday, these are things that we can do while our patients are at home and we are talking to them on the phone. Um, I just love to share this quote, change the food, change the world. So increasingly in public health centers around the world, um, there are teaching kitchens. And so the mentorship that you see here from a chef to a child and learning what real food is, uh, doesn't even have to be particularly healthy food, just real food made from basic nutrients, ba basic ingredients can make a huge impact on, on health. Um, and so here's my second book plug. This is from a, an old classmate, Roger Lucas. Um, it's a it's a really beautiful and entertaining book, um, but the main thing that I got wasn't you know chocolate. If folks don't know you know um, high content chocolate like 70% more chocolate doesn't have that much sugar in it. Um, there is sugar, it flows off, whatever. He tries to make this whole cute argument, but the point that I uh, thought was most impressive in the whole book was the cracker hypothesis. He says it's the crackers, and so I've started taking pictures that when kids come in, I look in the mouth. The parents ask me, sorry, I asked the parents, you know, when was the last time the kid ate? And they say, oh, he had a snack about three, four hours ago. And I can show them that this whatever, some weird Cheeto thing is still in the teeth, um, that this is what's festering there and causing cavities underneath. Um, and so it just stays around a long time. So uh, if there's nothing else that I do, but um, guide my patient, you know, during this lockdown, but guide my patients to uh, have less crackers and more real food. Um, I think I'm going to prevent some cavities and maybe even treat some. All right. Anyway, so cleansability, next big topic. Um, can a cavity be cleansed by the saliva and a toothbrush? Um, and the first place that I found this topic uh, was from good old GV Black uh, in my volume that I'm still borrowing from Dr. Martin McIntyre. Uh, where he describes in the section on management of children's teeth to leave the decayed material in the dentin where it is and open caries lesions to the flow of saliva. Uh, some people call this disking. Uh, there's been clinical trials recently on this in, in Europe uh, called non-restorative caries therapy, sorry, um, yeah, non-restorative caries therapy, which is unfortunately the same term that the ADA used for non-invasive procedures. Um, either way about it, uh, you open up a lesion to the flow of saliva. G.V. Black was doing this and teaching this uh, for decades, um, and it's in the 1908 book. The idea here is that the saliva has a very powerful ability to reverse lesions, um, but you can't have festering stagnant plaque there. That said, if, a, if an area is naturally cleansable, um, if we can do something simple to tip the scales, it will probably stop on its own. Um, so for example, uh, if you see a lesion uh, like the ones at top, these are cleansable lesions where you can get a toothbrush into the entirety of the lesion. Uh, the saliva is flowing through there. There's not really festering collection of food and plaque in there. And so if you just tip the scales with something like silver fluoride or a dietary change, um, or a high content fluoride toothpaste, chances are actually pretty good that you're gonna get control of these lesions. Um, and so in this case, silver fluoride was used and, and you can see that the lesions were properly arrested. Now, <clears throat> as opposed to uh, lesions that you see at the left in this radiograph, the dark spots on the second primary molars there, um, you can't imagine getting a toothbrush to the entirety of that lesion. There's no way to clean that all out. And so even though I used silver fluoride twice in this kiddo, and yes, plenty of cases like this, the lesions have stopped. Uh, unfortunately, in this kiddo, uh, the lesions did not stop. They progressed. We did something else. So at the left side, if I had seen that now, what I would plan to do is silver fluoride, dietary counseling, and put some kind of sealing material like a glass ionomer over the holes that are giving access to those lesions. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So these are non-cleansable lesions tend to grow. That's that's the idea. But what can we do about this? I referenced this earlier. Uh, in Europe, there's been this emergence of a term called non-restorative caries therapy, and that is really just the same as disking. It is opening up the flow of a of a festering lesion of a non-cleansable lesion to become a cleansable lesion. And so this is the outcome of, of a study. There's a group missing here. We'll get back. To the, to the area that's blocked out on the left, uh, but compared to 
conventional restorations placed by uh, board certified pediatric dentists and, and, and residents supervised by them, um, there's really no difference in the outcomes after two and a half years of just opening up lesions to the flow of saliva. Now, this requires a drill or similar, so this is not a coronavirus time uh, procedure, but to, to, to give the point of what lesions will respond with topical therapies and going forward, what we can do without restorations, uh, this is certainly an option. And, and so this clinical trial demonstrates that the response of the lesion to actually stop um, it matches you know, perfect uh, board certified pediatric dentist restorations. Another concept is, is of cleansability is the contact point. Um, so in the posterior area, especially with primary teeth, but also with permanent teeth, uh, in the further back in the mouth you go, um, the, broad, the more broad the contact point is, and therefore the less cleansable, the less the saliva flows, the, the more difficult it is to clean back there. As opposed to the anterior, <clears throat> where the contact point is smaller, saliva flows more, et cetera, lesions in these different areas will respond uh, accordingly. So if the contact point is small, much more likely to respond to just silver fluoride, dietary change, et cetera. Uh, and if it's between the back teeth where, where you cannot get a flow of saliva or a toothbrush, it's less likely. Now, sealing in carious lesions. Um, so this <laughs> concept is a little tricky. Uh, I wish you luck if you're trying to explain this to a patient, but for all of us, um, <laughs> Can someone survive if they're buried in cement? Um, and so this is a, a magician named Demian uh, who did a famous stunt of, of being buried in cement for 55 hours. Uh, I don't know what his partner uh, on the side is there, but it was pretty cute. Uh, and the idea is, of course, if you bury something in cement, it's not going to live. It needs air, it needs nutrients. And the idea, the analogy there uh, is, is to dentistry is that uh, if you really seal something, uh, if you really seal a caries lesion, even if there's bacteria on the inside, um, as long as you're not, as long as you don't have an abscess already in the pulp, uh, what we call pulpal necrosis, uh, you're going to be fine. And that's shocking, weird, and new. Actually, it's not that new. So this paper was published in 1986, uh, where Mertz Fairhurst was um, sealing cavitated caries lesions in where she could get a perfect enamel margin. So she could have some flash over the edges of the cavitation. And, and then she would open it up a month later or a year and a half later and check for bacteria. And she didn't find any vital bacteria underneath when the lesion was sealed. So that's a microbial study, but what about clinical trial? That's the highest level of evidence. Well, second highest. Once you have multiple clinical trials that are summarized and have the same outcome, that's the highest. But uh, whatever, point being that she did a clinical trial where she randomized sealing cavities in with resin, where she was able to flow over the side of the lesion onto healthy enamel uh, versus a traditional amalgam versus a sealed amalgam. And after 10 years, you can see that these things are all pretty much the same. The sealed amalgam did the best, uh, but really that didn't start to separate out until about six years later. And the outcome between the amalgam and just the sealant um, was really the same. And so that outcome really tells us that if you seal lesions in, they can't get any nutrients and bacteria can't keep flowing in there, um, the lesion is not going to grow and the tooth is going to be fine. And this is a wild idea. And what you really need, what one of the keys here is, is that you're actually able to seal the area. So in traditional restorations, one of the reasons that we, one of the most important concepts is having a perfect cavo surface margin that you're able to bond to and, and seal off the inside of that lesion from the outside with your restorative material. And so it turns out that we don't need to excavate the whole lesion to do that. And that's been really well hashed out. One of the best ways that this has been proven really and demonstrated um, and what's taught us the most is a procedure called the, the Hall Crown Technique. Uh, and so you know, I'm hoping to do another course just on the Hall Crown Technique in the coming weeks. But suffice to say, you take a lesion where there's not, you know, pulpal pathology, and you slap a stainless steel crown over the top with glass anamer cement and seal in the bacteria that are festering in that tooth. No nutrients, no growth. 
And so it's shocking how successful this procedure is. So one of the, uh, not even the most long-term, uh, but one of the clinical trials on this pr procedure shows a better clinical outcome than pediatric dentist conventional restorations or the, you know, the disking or what we were talking about earlier. So this is the same trial that I showed earlier. And what you can see is that using the hall crown technique on primary teeth, but sealing caries lesions in without any excavation whatsoever, without any drill, there's no aerosolizing procedure necessary here. Um, you can get a better clinical outcome than doing traditional techniques as demonstrated in this study. And that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, so that said, you know, do you have to go out and do this? No, but using the, the concepts here are really what's important. In a permanent tooth, um, doing this, you're going to get high occlusion. We'll talk about that later. That will drive a patient crazy, um, but can use an orthodontic band to seal uh, the, the margin, the periphery, and support a, a, a restoration. Speaking of restorations, uh, this is a concept that I've been fighting with for a long time now. Why do we really need a restoration if we can seal things? Do we need to excavate caries? What do we need to do? Um, and here is, is the best understanding that I can come up with at this time. I think, I think it'll help. So two, not all of the bases of restorations. Of course, there's restoration of form and function. But two of the primary reasons that we place restorations are to seal bacteria out, as we mentioned earlier, seal nutrients out, and, um, and to support that seal uh, with, with a hard tooth structure and the, the material itself. So, you know, for example, if you put a, a unfilled resin sealed over the top of a festering gigantic lesion, you wouldn't expect that to stay, it would break. Um, and so to maintain the seal, we need a, a hard foundation, uh, both from the tooth and from the restoration. Um, how does that happen? Why do we need it? What can we do about it? So looking at what a caries lesion is, as we all know, it starts from the outside and goes to the inside. And there's a correlation of the more active part of the lesion being very soft and the less active part of the lesion being very hard, of course. And that, as G.V. Black taught us, um, that happens from the bacteria degrading, the first demineralizing and then degrading the dentin. And so the softest part of the dentin really is just all bacteria and maybe some tooth protein. And as you get down, it's, there's unaffected dentin, affected dentin, everything in between. But in the middle, what it turns out is that if you treat these lesions with a, a, a topical like silver fluoride, silver diamine fluoride, silver nitrate and fluoride, varnish silver and fluoride, the softest, most active part of the lesion will condense down from being the soft, fluffy, sticky, white, yellow part to being actually a very hard surface. And so it's the outermost component when you treat a lesion with silver fluoride Maybe you have to treat once, maybe you have to treat three times. This kind of lesion, I would treat twice. That will condense down. All that soft, sticky dentin will condense down. And what you'll see is that it will become a hard scab. Now we made this particular slide to really look at the wires that are coming down and they're, they're beautiful and interesting. But the point of showing this here is the very top of it. It kind of looks like a magic carpet riding along. That's an extraordinarily dense layer that's way more dense than enamel. That's produced from the reaction of the silver in particular with the infected necrotic dentin. Not a necrotic pulp, but the, what's called histologically is the necrotic dentin. And it condenses down from, from maybe even a millimeter, but, uh, but 200 microns or so of down to about 10 microns. And so that's intensely hard and intensely dense. And that can support a restoration. So there's been a few studies where we've been trying to publish our studies on this, but um, there's been a, one of the studies that's been published, a beautiful uh, work from, from really the, the people who have brought us silver fluoride. You know, it was in Japan for 50 years, but these are the people who have really brought it out to the rest of the world. It was the group in Hong Kong. Um, 
led by Drs. Chu and Lo. And so they, they looked at um, the hardness of silver fluoride arrested uh, dentin, and that's the red up at top, and um, healthy dentin is extending out to the right. And then uh, the blue is a, is a normal uh, cavitated caries lesion. And so what's interesting is that, um, and what we found this to be very consistent, is that the silver fluoride arrested dentin is at least twice as hard as healthy dentin. And so why wouldn't you use that as a base for your restoration to support what we're really trying to do, which is seal in the lesion? So uh, as an example, this is a beautiful um, uh, case done by Dr. John Fricella that, that Dr. Jong Sito and I uh, took to do a micro CT, look on the inside. Um, and so what's been done here is that the, the, there's been partial caries removal and then silver fluoride to harden the infected necrotic dentin, make it condense, and then putting a glass ionomer over the top that will aid in the re remineralization. It'll give fluoride, it'll give some of the metal ions that also help to strengthen the tooth and keep the bacteria at bay. But then it also provides the base of, for the restoration so that you can maintain your seal, keep the nutrients out, the bacteria out, and the tooth strong enough so that it doesn't crumble. So based on all these ideas, um, quite a few of us uh, have started doing, combining all these concepts. So if there is a lesion that is accessible, that maybe isn't cleansable, it's not a, a bowl, an open bowl, maybe that has more of a top to it so you can't get the toothbrush through it, we treat with silver fluoride and allow time, as in have the patient back a week later, or a month later, or two months later, allow time for the silver fluoride to react and harden the lesion, condense the lesion down so that it becomes a strong foundation and platform for a restoration. So I don't have the pre-treatment photo here. Uh, this is a little three-year-old, just turned three, so uh, I was happy to get these pictures. Um, but in a little three-year-old where if I used air spray or water spray or a drill or a rubber dam, uh, that could be screaming your head off and running away. Note, those are the procedures that produce aerosols. Instead, what we did was we dried with cotton, two by two gauze or uh, uh, cotton roll, uh, and put silver fluoride into the lesion, let it soak up for about count of 10, get rid of the excess with some more cotton, put a little varnish or Vaseline over the top to protect that interaction, protect that reaction for the next couple of minutes, send her on her way, have her back a different day, use some conditioner, some polyacrylic acid, which I tell them tastes like lemon juice, because it really does. Um, and I scrub that in there just the same as I gently, gently, gently scrubbed the silver fluoride in to remove the plaque and pellicle at the periphery of the lesion for the enamel that I really want to bond to. And then squirt in some glass ionomer, protect from saliva contamination with Vaseline, as Dr. Martin McIntyre taught all of us and ad uh, adapt the restoration with my finger with, with a little Vaseline over the top. Have the patient bite down, remove the excess very gently, no dramatically aerosolizing procedures, and this is a six-month follow-up for this restoration. And if you notice, the teeth uh, in front and behind it also uh, got some glass ionomer sealants that can be preventive going forward. Another example, this was actually my first, what I call the two-step smart or the no-prep smart, um, this kiddo, we did this in 2015, um, and the same idea. We did silver fluoride a few times, um, and we went back and literally just shoved some glass ionomer into there. I didn't use conditioner. I would always, whenever possible, use conditioner now, but I literally just squirted glass ionomer in there, and this is three years after we placed the restorations. Didn't mean for them to be restorations, I meant for them to be topicals, but it turns out that because the silver fluoride hardened the lesion so much that it provided a solid base for those things to stay in there. Um, and it was just this kiddo's birthday and I'm glad he's, he's uh, still wheeling around doing well. Um, <clears throat> Dr. McLean, uh, who's speaking later today, um, and some of the rest of us really following her work and the work of Tim Wright and others, um, have been using these same procedures to harden um, moderate to severe molar incisor hypomineralization. So when a tooth comes in already soft from an incomplete um, tooth development, 
what you can do is, is those teeth are very sensitive. And so we use silver fluoride on those teeth, both to treat the sensitivity, but also to harden any of the dentin and enamel that came in underdeveloped. And it will condense those areas down, as you see on the tooth on, on the right here, this really pretty severe um, MIH tooth on this six-year-old phobic kiddo. Um, it will harden it up. You have to allow at least three days, I would say two weeks in this kind of case, uh, for the lesion to solidify and respond. Um, and then you can come back later and place a glass ionomer or whatever you like um, to seal over the lesion, keep debris, nutrients, and all that out. So at bottom uh, on the right, you can see that I used an orthodontic band to support the restoration because I didn't think that um, using my finger to place the restoration in this really phobic kid would be enough. But she did let me get an orthodontic band sat, uh, seated in there really nicely so that I was able to support the seal for this, this permanent tooth. You can also see that my um, anatomy <laughs> was horrible. Uh, I usually do a lot better than that, I promise. But, um, but this is clinically adequate for at least a few years coming, coming down the line. Um, another way that we can use this, and, and again, this is something that I learned from Dr. Jeanette McLean, is for providing a more long-term uh, solution um, in, in cases where, where we really can't get in um, and apply our restorations in a traditional sense. And so this is a kiddo who had just turned two. She was like 25 months old when I met her. Um, a previous dentist uh, in the Central Valley of California had placed silver fluoride a few times. I was really worried about pulp exposure, about how deep it was on the laterals. Um, the mom convinced me to try to play silver fluoride one more time, see how it would work. Um, and we did. They hardened up really nicely. I didn't feel there was a pulpal exposure. Um, and what we did just right in the mom's lap, uh, the child being totally happy and calm, um, is that we uh, fitted some plastic uh, strip crowns, some, some tooth forms. Um, we used a little conditioner um, with on a micro brush and then used a, a two by two to dry before the conditioner and dry and remove the excess after and a, just a wet two by two to remove the, the conditioner afterwards, sorry, and then dry with a, a two by two where you don't want the area to be totally dry for glass cyanomer. So it really works out perfectly. I didn't have to use suction. I didn't have to use air, didn't have to use a drill. Um, and after waiting three minutes for the glass cyanomer to set, I got the form out and the, getting the form out probably induces a little aerosol. Um, but just like careful scaling, we can really minimize that. Um, and are these perfectly aesthetic restorations? No, but are those going to support uh, the health of those teeth uh, going forward with the sealed lesions that are hardened by silver fluoride? I'm pretty sure they are. Uh, so this really puts things together. So again, just in terms of one particular detail, um, the glass animal needs to interact with the tooth not the plaque or the pellicle. You get a chemical fusion zone that's been demonstrated both in dentin and enamel. And so if you can harden the lesion with silver fluoride so that it'll provide the structural support that we need, we still need to get the plaque and the dental pellicle out of the way. And the best way to do that really is with conditioner. In this time of coronavirus going forward and being gentle on, to patients in general, you can skip the profi brush, uh, like I showed with the, with the couple of these teeth. Um, just apply conditioner and let it sit for at least 10 seconds, maybe 20 if the patient will tolerate. Remove the conditioner. You don't have to remove it perfectly because it's the monomer for the restoration. It's not like leaving acid etched on a tooth that will demineralize and get in the way of the restoration. You can really just gently remove it with a damp two by two. And then when you dry with a dry two by two, the tooth is still moist enough um, to, to have the glass enamor directly interact with the tooth. So that's a particularly important detail for, for sealing with glass armor or restoring. Okay, so the idea here is that we presented the conceptual overview from staging as a cavitation or not. Is there a hole or not? There's not a hole. Um, let's use our, our patient-centered communication to figure out what the best technique would be to uh, help these lesions remineralize. Is that silver fluoride? Is that brushing with fluoride toothpaste? Or lots of things in between. An antimicrobial like iodine that patient might have, might, patients might have in their home now, um, etc. Healthy, uh, healthy diet. Um, is is the lesion cleansable, and therefore is it more likely to respond to uh, non-restorative caries treatments? Is it not cleansable, and therefore really 
would most likely succeed if we seal it up. Uh, we went over the concept of sealing curious dentin in, um, as really demonstrated by the Hall technique and the work of, of Mertz Fairhurst, um, and, and having a foundation for integral strength uh, of supporting that seal to make the tooth cleansable, to remove the cavitation. So putting all this together, um, really it's, it's kind of all right there uh, in the American Dental Association caries classification system, but we're gonna make it even more simple and obvious. Um, and so, oh, here. So uh, just counseling and topicals when it's not cavitated procedures, when it is, but here's my suggestion of an algorithm for minimally invasive, maximally effective caries management. Is there a caries lesion? Yes. Is it cavitated? If it's not cavitated, let's try non-restorative therapy. If it is cavitated, then the question comes up, is it cleansable? If it is cleansable, let's try non-restorative therapy. It probably will work. If it's not cleansable, is it accessible? Can we directly access it? If it is, then let's do the no prep smart or a minimal prep or whatever you like, but you can do uh, without local anesthetic, with or without a drill, um, and harden a lesion with silver fluoride and then seal over it with glass ionomer. Dr. McLean's gonna be talking a lot more about this in a couple hours. And then if, it, if it's not accessible, that's really where we still need some good dentistry. Um, can we do a hall crown? Is it a primary tooth? Is it a permanent tooth that's just erupting? So that's just kids. Uh, is it an unopposed tooth occlusively? All of those would lead you to consider the option of a hall crown. Um, of course, we can always consider putting an orthodontic band around a tooth in the same, uh, using the same concepts as a hall crown. We can do, do that for permanent teeth. I showed you a molar incisor hypoplasia where I did that, hypomineralization where I did that. Um, or maybe that's an indication for our good old uh, class two restorations or crowns or whatever. But if you go through this, you're gonna eliminate a lot of patients and lesions <clears throat> from really needing our advanced restorative procedures so that everyone can be involved in helping patients um, move towards non-restorative approaches, minimally invasive approaches that will decrease the chance of aerosolizing and transmitting, uh, or will decrease the chance of dental fear and will help to control uh, dental caries going forward. Uh, so with that, that was our outline. That's what we got through. I thank everyone for your time. Uh, we're gonna have questions in just a minute here, and I do wanna plug uh, the next two talks, uh, sorry for my makeshift slide here, but um, these are the next two talks from Elevate. Um, I want to share my disclosure. I was not paid for this talk at all. Uh, I am doing this um, uh, because I, I want to be of help during this time. Um, as you know, Elevate didn't charge you for this. Um, in the past, Elevate has paid me to be a speaker for, for their group, and they have um, supported me to speak for other groups. Um, as well, uh, GC America has, uh, the National Institutes of Health, um, uh, Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. So if you don't believe in Facebook and, and hate that stuff, um, I, I have been supported by some of their money. So take it with all a grain of salt. Um, and uh, with that, I want to plug uh, the next two talks. So Jeanette McLean um, in a couple hours here and Paul Glassman will be talking about teledentistry this coming Tuesday. Um, the next, so a week from today, I'll be talking about silver fluoride. The next week, there will probably be more talks. Uh, much love, everybody. Let's get to some questions. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Horst. That was a wonderful presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, before we get to the questions, one quick comment. There were several comments that came through with technical questions and connection questions. Uh, likely, these are due to the traffic that's on the cell phone lines and the internet right now with everyone working from home. If you had to log in multiple times, the sum of the time that you were on the webinar will be used for calculation for the continuing education credit. Again, we'll email those certificates out to everybody within the next seven to 14 days. And we've also recorded this program and we'll be recording, uh, we'll be posting that recording on our website uh, several days after this is recorded as soon as we can get it posted there. So having said that, let's go to some questions. We actually have several here. Uh, the first of which is, Dr. Horst, could you make a comment on the use of iodine for caries control? Ooh, what a treat. Thank you for asking that. So as I shared, um, 
the more I've learned about the carriage process and our ability to intervene in it, the more I realize that that uh, if the what we traditionally take as preventive approaches, if they're really done well, frequently enough, dramatically enough, they can control the carriage process. The great example of this is silver fluoride. We think about this as a treatment for caries because it works. But if you just apply it to sound enamel, uh, whether or dense and exposed roots, um, once a year, you get about 60% less new cavities. So based on that and concern about staining, I have been exploring other options. Um, and in particular, trying to find things that we can empower for patients to do themselves. So this will be the first time I've publicly mentioned it. Um, the, 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 there are no formal studies, but um, there are many good clinical trials demonstrating a powerful preventive effect of iodine for dental caries. It kills the bacteria. It seems to stay in the teeth for long enough to help prevent um, caries from forming, but it doesn't stay in the teeth for as, as long or as well as silver fluoride does. So the studies that demonstrate effectiveness are placing iodine with or without fluoride varnish um, four to six times per year. So that's pretty high frequency. And so my thought was that if, it, and when that's about 60%, if you combine uh, iodine with fluoride four to six times a year, you get about 60% preventive fraction, which is the same as the preventive fraction of silver fluoride once a year. So my thought is that if I have a patient where I would want to place silver fluoride twice a year, or three times a year, what could I do with iodine that also kills bacteria and stays in the tooth, but not quite as well, and fluoride to help get that same effect. And so for about a year and a half now, we've been exploring the use of iodine placed at home, 10% povidone iodine, betadine, same thing, placed at home once a week for a month, and then once a month or twice a month, um, along with fluoride toothpaste, but just right before you go to bed, um, brush the teeth, rinse and spit, uh, and then place betadine with a Q-tip uh, along the high-risk areas, particularly along the gum line and, and interproximal areas with just with a Q-tip, um, and allow that to soak in kind of overnight. And we've been getting dramatically uh, impressive results, not 100%, uh, but pretty close. And so the idea here is that if we kill the bacteria, silver does that, and if the thing that kills the bacteria stays in the tooth, silver does that, um, and we remineralize with fluoride, uh, maybe we can control some cavities. Now, in this time right right now, um, if patients happen to have iodine at home, I believe, without any clinical trial support, that that is the most effective thing that we can do to help them control their cavities, is we add this antimicrobial that stays in the porous uh, parts of the teeth uh, for a reasonable amount of time and add that onto fluoride and everything else we're doing. Um, I can make a, a video and have that available uh, for people to see. But that's the concept. No clinical trials on that. It's new, but it's something that we could um, offer to our patients. And certainly it works for prevention. There's there's quite a few clinical trials on that. Okay. Thank you. The next question, uh, back to the aerosols that are produced, uh, the studies that were done earlier. Do elect electric hand produce less aerosols? Is there any data there? I have not found any data on electric hand pieces versus air-driven turbines. Uh, there may be data. I have not seen that. Okay. Next question. <clears throat> Our organization ad advises that during this COVID-19 outbreak, we should ask a patient to rinse with hydrogen peroxide for two minutes, but not chlorhexidine. Is there data effect showing the efficacy of hydrogen peroxide? <laughs> So um, I have not seen data for dentistry, um, but if you go back to slide seven, um, the, there, there is de definitely studies of this coronavirus, let alone other coronaviruses, that hydrogen peroxide works better than chlorhexidine and similar materials to, to kill uh, the virus. So I think I'd support that idea um, if patients can tolerate it, which I think is pretty easy. Um, I would go hydrogen peroxide, even though it hasn't been studied in the mouth, we know chlorhexidine works in the mouth uh, pretty well, so why not use something that's better on other surfaces where it has been tested on this specific virus? Okay, very good. Uh, we had a question about N95 masks. Um, the, they may have to be fitted on the provider a few times per year. Do you have any information regarding that? 
I don't. We need we need more information on what fitting is. I, I talked to a you know a nurse neighbor and she says that she always fails the fit test and she is a smart lady who knows how to use materials. She's an oncology nurse, so that's concerning to me. Uh, other than that, I don't have any useful information. Okay. Um, there was one question came in. I'm, I'm going to read this as it was written. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Horst and team for taking the time up to share your experience. I have a query about when to do restorations during radiographic interpretation, adult E1 observation, E2 observation, if high carries, then does the restoration, uh, enamel break and D1 restorations, primary E1 and E2, enamel break, do restorations no matter how lo low or high risk patients, and what are the restoration choices for <laughs> I'm not sure I articulated that well. I understand that, I understand that question. Um, okay. So according to the American Dental Association, uh, D1 lesions are very unlikely to have an actual break. That's news to most of us. Uh, if you look at the studies that they cite, they're pretty solid. Um, and so yes, there's demineralization and yes, your high-speed handpiece will feel a little jump when you go through the porous enamel that's there. Um, but it's pretty well accepted um, by folks who have looked at this carefully and our clinicians or our careful scientists um, that that is the case, that even D1 lesions are not cavitated and therefore could respond. Um, and, you know, as a practicing pediatric dentist, I, I see patients where it is extremely unlikely that anything positive is going to change at home. Uh, we respect that. Um, that's where we use our clinical judgment. Um, if I have a patient that has, you know, where we've tried and we're going to keep trying to change things um, and they're under general anesthesia, or for example, in COVID-19 land, if you are taking extraordinary measures to get this patient, uh, you know, with a rubber dam and everybody's safe, um, you know, I, it makes sense to me clinically to go ahead and, and treat the early lesions. Um, because you have, with your clinical judgment, you have decided that that it's unlikely for that lesion to stop. Um, that said, you know, try it on your other patients. Uh, I've seen D1 lesions stay for decades, um, and and it can work in permanent teeth. So clinical judgment, try. If it grows, sure, treat it. Okay, very good. Um... Next question is regarding the saliva production. Did you men you mentioned that vitamin K or vitamin E uh, promotes production? Uh, uh, vitamin D. We'll go over that in the prevention um, course. Okay. But vitamin D um, increases the the quality of the saliva and actually prevents dental caries. Uh, there's a study from Philippe Pujol looking at uh, many studies, 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, vitamin K2 probably also has a huge impact on the saliva. Um, but it's vitamin D, and that's D2 or D3, or running around naked in the sun. Okay, very good. Um, next uh, question is, is there any evidence that regular baking soda or baking soda toothpaste, which have a pH of about 8.5, can provide long-term acid buffering capabilities from regular use, or is it mostly short-term and immediately after use? There are those studies looking at the pH after uh, baking soda. Um, the best study that I've seen was one done by Featherstone, and it was looking at how the pH changes over time, where they went out hours and they looked at zero stomach patients versus normal, you know, people with healthy saliva. Um, and the baking soda really did help to bring the pH back to uh, neutral, and it, and it stayed around for an impressive amount of time. Um, so it, it works. As far as I know, and I've looked pretty hard, there's no studies of baking soda with caries as an outcome, which is our sort of threshold for levels of evidence for pushing that really hard. But, um, you know, <laughs> baking soda has been used in, in toothpaste for uh, centuries. And so I'm sure it, I'm sure it works. <laughs> okay. uh, the next, two, next question is actually two parts. Um, is there a name for the procedure of opening the carious lesion for cleansing? And do you recommend breaking contacts to make teeth more cleansable and approximal? Great, great, great question. So um, if you're in, in Europe and some people are joining us from Europe, I believe, um, that is now called non-restorative caries therapy, <laughs> uh, which is a little confusing, as I mentioned. If you're in the US, uh, that can be called enamelplasty. That's the, the, the billable code 
is enamel plasty. Um, we build that code, we get paid on that code um, that works. And, and GV Black um, and others called it disking. So these are the terms at the top here. Uh, so depending on where you are, different terms. Um, and GV Black made a point about trying to preserve uh, the gingival margin, which of course makes sense, um, and part of the contact point so that you uh, can minimize shifting uh, of the teeth. So if you look at the top right, you can see how he preserves the, the facial extent of the contact and opens up the lingual extent of the contact. The lingual brings the saliva in, the facial preserves the, uh, the spacing. Okay. Uh, the next several questions, I'll, I'll condense these down into one, is regarding the SMART technique. Can you discuss, um, does SDF affect bonding? Uh, do you have to do a separate day or can you do same day? And what do you mean when you talk about uh, protecting a surface with Vaseline or uh, other materials? Awesome questions. First, check out Jeanette in a little less than two hours. She's incredible. Second, um, so there, there was just a meta-analysis, which is, which is an overview, a, a statistical analysis where they bring in all the data from different studies together and uh, both unanimously and from the meta-analysis, silver fluoride makes no impact on bond strength uh, of glass ionomer to dentin of enam of, or enamel or of, or of resin to dentin or enamel. The one thing that they found is that if you leave silver fluoride on, uh, and then put resin bonding and then the filling on, uh, then you do decrease the bond strength, so rinse afterwards. So if you're placing a resin restoration, uh, if you want to maintain 100% of your bond strength, all you need to do is let that silver fluoride soak in for one to three minutes and then etch bond fill. Um, and it's been demonstrated that using self-etch or full etch or whatever you want, will maintain your bond strength as long as you do it after the silver fluoride treatment or resin specifically. Um, we have a paper accepted showing that uh, using silver fluoride for bonding glass anomer to dentin um, actually increases the bond strength to demineralize dentin to more than the bond strength would be to healthy dentin. So it actually seems to maybe, you know, read the paper, make conclusions for yourself. It's a laboratory study, it's not a clinical study. Um, but we think that because of the way that this hardens and produces more mineral inside the lesion, um, that it supports interactions with glass ionomer when you actually have demineralized dentin. So it certainly doesn't hurt. So that was the first question. Does it affect bond strength? No. Uh, I'm sure Jeanette will speak to that and give references in her talk. I can give references to anyone that wants them uh, afterwards, but that, that study was just published in 2019, the meta-analysis of all these other studies. Um, yeah. Same day versus two day, um, you can do either, of course. Uh, my focus is on really minimizing intervention. Um, and so you can use silver fluoride same day to minimize your excavation, uh, where you take out part of the lesion, the really soft part, um, and then you put silver fluoride on to treat the infected dentin that's, that's hard enough. Uh, you will get some hardening, some extra hardening there for sure. Uh, you won't get as much condensing, so you do need to, to remove more if it's same day. Uh, Doug Young has shown that if you place silver fluoride and then do some excavation, maybe hit it with a light, not a curing light, but let the, the operatory light set some of that silver fluoride. Uh, you excavate that part. You can use that to control the stain. Uh, and John Fratella and Kate Quas and Jenna McLean, and many others, Steve Duffin, have, have definitely demonstrated that same day smarts um, especially the ones that don't turn out so aesthetic, uh, really last extremely well. Um, for me, I feel like minimizing the invasiveness, uh, both from air spray, water spray, um, excavation at all. If I can do a restoration without excavating at all, that really increases the number of patients that I can treat more expediently. So the patient has to come twice, but the interventions are, you know, one minute each, three minutes, five minutes, uh, very simple and easy to do. And we have extraordinary success rates with, with both approaches. Okay. Uh, and can you comment on the use of polyacrylic acid? Is it recommended? Is there a certain type that's best? Excellent question. So the polyacrylic acid, I definitely, definitely, definitely would uh, recommend it. Can you get away with it sometimes without using it sometimes? Definitely. 
um, where was it? These restorations were placed in and stayed in for years uh, until the teeth fell out um, without polyacrylic acid. But what you really need is for glass anomer to directly interact with the tooth. And so if there's plaque or pellicle in the way, the glass anomer cannot interact with the tooth. Uh, and so you're really relying on your physical force of shoving the glass anomer in, which should not be very hard, uh, to displace the plaque and pellicle, which is, it's not gonna do very well. Um, so the, the conditioner does that chemically. It doesn't demineralize the tooth, so you're not hurting the tooth like you would with etch. Uh, so it's a pretty simple thing. It doesn't taste very bad. It tastes kind of like, really tastes like, I tell the kids it tastes like lemon. And, um, and there is a yellow conditioner out there uh, that then supports that concept that happens to be produced by Elevate. And the, the other stuff is blue and it's great too. So uh, leave it on for at least 10 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds, 10 to 20%. Um, it all seems to work really well. Okay. The next question is regarding the strip crown case that you showed. Do you have to remove the strip strip crown form or do you leave it on? Oh, that was a softball from somebody. So you, you do have to re you remove the strip crown form or it will irritate the gingiva. However, many people will send the patient home, let the glass anomer set, let that be a really easy visit and have the patient back in a week once the glass anomer has really set up and the patient is stoked on how easy the procedure went um, and then remove the forms. So th those forms do need to be uh, removed. Okay. Uh, I mean, unless you really polish and trim them incredibly well, which I don't, I don't uh, do, nor do I recommend because it's just plastic. They'll okay. actually, they, they need to be removed. They will tear up uh, from occlusion if, if you don't. Okay. Um, what if there's a small pulp exposure and it's missed and silver diamond fluoride is placed? What kind of reaction and outcome should be expected? Mm. We'll get to that a little bit in the um, in the silver fluoride talk that we'll do a week from today. Um, but we have not had problems with that. We definitely do not choose to put silver fluoride on the pulp. Um, but if there is some small pulp exposure, what happens is that you have um, a little pocket of reaction. This was really well studied in the 30s and 40s with silver nitrate. Um, and you have something that, that at first glance looks like a micro abscess uh, in the pulp. Um, but if you look more carefully, it's actually the pulp has walled itself off like it does for a partial pulpotomy um, and seems to heal around it. So it's a careful balance. And I wouldn't suggest that we do it intentionally, but it does, um, there is strong evidence that the pulp can respond to silver, um, to, to, to impressive amount of silver. Um, that said, it is an irritant, just like calcium hydroxide. It may be more irritating than calcium hydroxide. So I wouldn't recommend to put it directly on the pulp, but um, both uh, you know, in terms of the histology that we have, and in particular, in terms of the clinical response that we have, we just have not had almost any patients um, demonstrate you know, a pulpal reaction when we're placing this on, on deep lesions where there could be a small exposure. We've seen nightmares when people put it right on the pulp when there's a huge exposure. So we don't want that, but uh, the risk benefits need to be taken into account from each clinician in each situation. Um, and I feel like we've been really lucky and, and blessed. Um, and so uh, our, the, the consensus from people who have been doing this for, for years and years now is that, um, you know, it seems like when some teeth abscess after silver fluoride treatment, uh, it was just that we got there too late. We haven't seen any, any you know, um, any evidence otherwise. So we feel really lucky about that. Um, and so just with good clinical judgment, uh, you're gonna you're gonna get success. If if the lesion is too deep, then you're not gonna get success. Okay. Uh, next question is regarding staining. SDF will stain demineralized areas, but won't stain healthy dentin. Uh, a lot of people, children, don't want that stain on their teeth and the lesions. Um, is there any issue doing an aesthetic composite restoration over top of those surfaces, or do you only recommend glass ionomers? No, oh, you can use composite for sure. It's um, the the issue is that composite is you know requires a little bit more invasiveness, uh, which which is fine uh, when it's fine, um, and that composite is much more translucent. So for the slide that's being shown now, those Forte strip crowns, if that was if that was composite, uh, that would be all black as opposed to just you know uh, a pretty heavy <laughs> black shading towards the gingival. 
Um, so it's just more translucent and that makes it prettier usually, um, but you can use uh, um, uh, any type of opaquer that you want. There's, there's a beautiful glass animer opaquer from Elevate. Uh, there's gorgeous, um, you know, flowable opaquers from other folks uh, that, are, that are more resin based. There, there's lots of good options and, and there's no reason not to use resin if that's what you're really comfortable with. It's just the glass animer requires less, less invasiveness and then it actually also supports the health of the teeth long term. And then um, next question is, uh, is the interproximal application using a tufted floss still a recommended application method? Oh, that's a good question. We'll definitely get into that um, in the silver fluoride talk in one week. But um, in short, you know, use your intuition as to how to get silver fluoride into the uh, interproximal area. Um, GV Black was using unwaxed floss to get silver nitrate between the teeth. You know, um, Jason Hirsch and Jeanette McLean have been using super floss. Uh, I just dry with air and apply. Um, you know, in this coronavirus land, in the in the coming months, if I'm treating, I, I probably won't use an air stream, so I probably will use the unwaxed floss. Uh, but use your intuition; it works. Okay. And then the last um, last question I think we're going to get into is, can you briefly touch on not only the silver diming fluoride codes that are used, but the codes, if there are any, that are used for opening up lesions to allow for cleansing? Are there different codes that you would use for these different types of procedures? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Um, so D1354 is placing silver fluoride without removal of healthy tooth structure. Um, disking, I don't know what the code is. I'm sure somebody can look that up. Steve, maybe you can have somebody look at, at the team. Enamelplasty um, is a, is a CD, has a CDT code, um, and that is opening up the lesion. D1208 is using silver fluoride, or is using any fluoride besides fluoride varnish for preventing caries. So 1354 for treating caries, uh, 1208 for preventing caries, uh, enamel plasty, there's a code. I don't have it offhand. Um, and then if you're doing, you know, a one day smart where you're putting silver fluoride on the tooth and then whatever the restoration is, glass animer, resin, whatever, uh, that is a filling. You cannot bill 1354. Uh, well, at least you probably won't get paid for it. Um, and place a restoration in the same day. And different states have different ways of dealing with that. Some require that you wait three weeks, some require that you wait three months um, between billing for silver fluoride and, and billing for a restoration uh, in terms of the of the insurance providers pay uh, payers uh, paying for that. So that but of course you can do whatever you want uh, that your patient chooses. So those are the codes. Okay, and I believe the code that you were asking about earlier there, Dr. Horse, was D9971. That's right, that's right. D9971 for disking enamel plasty. Okay. GB Black talked about it a year, you know, 112 years ago. It's, it's all good and ain't new. Okay. Um, uh, the rest of these, uh, the question seems to align with things that we've already discussed. Uh, there may be a few that we missed in, in the midst of this, but I think that's going to wrap up the question portion. Nice. Um, please keep in mind that we will be having, Dr. Horst will be joining us next week for another deeper dive into silver diamine fluoride. Please join us there if you have additional questions. We'll he'll most likely be able to answer those there. We also have another webinar coming up later this afternoon from Dr. Jeanette McLean. Um, if you don't have a link to that already, please contact us at 877-866-9113, and we'll be able to connect you to that. And also look on our social media pages uh, for the registration pages in the coming days. Well, we appreciate everyone joining today, and thank you very much. And we will email the certificates out to you within the next 7 to 14 days, hopefully before that. Uh, and again, these will be recorded and posted on our website as soon as we can get them there. Thank you very much for joining us today.